game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ram Das Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. And uh, I was uh, prompted by our media library custodian, <laughs> librarian, Nathan Wilburn, uh, on a particular podcast. So he says to me, is there... You all know me as Raghu, but my full name is Raghvindra Das. But I never tell anybody that because it's way too complex of a name for people to even think of pronouncing. Even in India, they couldn't pronounce it, which led me to just use Raghu. And uh, he said, is there any other uh, this Raghvindra Das? Do you know? And I said, not in the satsang. I don't think so. I mean, I don't know. He's, I said, why? He said, well, Ram Das in this talk is introducing Krishna Das and Raghvindra Das. And I went, oh, that's got to be from the mid-70s, right? He said, yep. So he actually found a talk, and I remember uh, drumming. I, uh, in those days, in the mid-70s, I was actually doing some drumming for the Krishna Das. And uh, at uh, particularly at Ramdas events, and this was in Boston. It was around Easter time, and I really do remember it because I'm drumming along, and Krishnas is singing and chanting, and it's you know all lovely ecstatic stuff. And but suddenly I look down, and there's blood everywhere. I'm going, holy shit, what happened? And and it's my and I you know, look at my hand, and sure enough, uh, the the ring that I had on my finger, on my left hand, had actually, uh, from smacking the drum so hard, and there might be even a few of you out there listening to this who remember me smacking the drum real hard, and I uh, cut my, it cut into my, into my finger, and I was literally gushing blood everywhere. <laughs> it was a scene. And it was at this lecture. Uh, so this has all sorts of nostalgia for me. But it is uh, uh, it is a, a, a wonderful talk. And uh, also in that moment, he uh, in that evening, he introduced his dad because it was in Boston. And in fact, he had all sorts of different people uh, from his past, from the Harvard days, from the psychedelic days, from the Millbrook days, from the India days, from the Joya days. He's, and he talked about it. He had everybody there. So it was uh, quite, a, um, quite a moment, the strands of his story as he talks, woven uh, through his audience, uh, his story. Um, so you know what he talks a lot about, aside from the fact that it was Easter, and he, he talked about Christ and Christ on the cross on the Friday and then resurrected on a Sunday, so there was a couple of days there. And it, it's pretty interesting how he uses that analogy uh, and, and then converts it into talking about all of the different forms, uh, traditions, forms uh, from different uh, uh, spiritual tradition, religious traditions, um, uh, forms uh, of uh, different meditative uh, uh, forms and chanting and, you know, everything from uh, the Judaic tradition to, uh, to shamanistic traditions. And he talks about all these different forms. And, and what's common to all of the forms is not another form. They, it's it's an exclusive uh, arrangement, and uh, what but what is common 
once you go into the interior of these forms, you get to what he calls a, and what it's a it's a uh, it's called cho- choiceless awareness, which is a particular meditation method that's used in various different traditions, um, and uh, that's something. I actually want to investigate with him a little bit more, uh, and and certainly a, a choiceless awareness has in its ingredient um, a, a detachment from thoughts. You are not chasing your thoughts once you get so. You, there has to be one pointedness before this meditation. I think can be uh, focused and useful. Uh, you are just absorbing into whatever. Uh, events and whatever um, uh, properties come up either through, uh, I mean, orally or through the through the senses and in many different ways. So it is a very interesting meditation. It's something that um, uh, we're going to investigate here a little bit more at uh, ramdas.org for everybody. Um, how does it all come together? So basically, if he talks about if you follow any of these forms to its apex, you are pushed beyond the form and into the moment. And uh, this gets into a um, something I remember he used to talk about so much back in the day, uh, because we all had different ideas about the different methods that were available. And he, of course, introduced so many different methods from Sufi dancing to chanting to Vipassana meditation and uh, sitting Zazen, uh, which he did as well. Uh, He really investigated uh, many, many, many different methods from non-dual to uh, devotional. And uh, so we always had in our minds, okay, what uh, do this method, do that method. And, and you know, we used to see lots of people getting pretty attached to their particular method and becoming a little bit of a fundamentalist sometimes. We all have done that. And here he says, the methods, methods are the ship crossing the ocean of existence. Methods are traps but you entrap yourself in order to burn out things in you that keep you from being free. And in the end, method self-destructs. He says disintegrates, but self-destructs. So uh, I think that's a a very important uh, point, has been uh, uh, for me. Uh, I remember getting involved with uh, Vipassana meditation in particular, which I've touted quite a bit either here on Mind Rolling Podcast. Um, And, God, anybody who told me they were doing visualizations, I was like, what are you talking about? The only real meditation is Vipassana. Again, you know, we we would get very uh, fundamentalist, uh, and people do. And they forget that this is just a vehicle, and it's a vehicle that gets dropped in the end. If it's going to do its work, its real work. Um, What does he say here also? If we push our dark stuff under the rug, sooner or later there is karmuppance. Do you ever hear that? (laughs) Karmuppance. I love that. I mean, I remember hearing it a long time ago. I want a T-shirt. Watch out or you're going to get karmuppance. He also, in, in, in this talk, tells one... Great, great story about going to death row to be with uh, people who, in within sixty or ninety days, were going to be executed. And he, I think he said he saw maybe I don't know thirty, forty people, and out of them, only several, five or something, were not um, had not transformed in some way to have some kind of awareness because. Of, of this impending death uh, and, and Ramdas work with them, they faced execution and they were forced, as he said, to awaken in some way. So he was telling this story to Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is, was uh, a great uh, 
uh, expert on death and dying, one of the first uh, authors of those kinds of books that uh, really helped to, uh, for us to approach dealing with death, something we don't talk about in this culture, or had not. We do it a lot more now. And, and after he told her this story, she said, I love this, don't you understand we are all on death row? How cool is that? <laughs> um, and in the end, uh, all we can do, once we understand we are all on death row, we just need to keep cleaning up our act. So we do the practices, and they take f different forms, different methods, and uh, it doesn't matter. It's just a matter of if you're if these practices are working then attachment will be evaporated at least to the degree where you're uh, not becoming a fundamentalist <laughs> let's put it that way uh, you do the practices and you sweep the temple that's all there is to it love that so uh, thank you everybody for continuing to listen and um Thanks for also tuning in to our uh, MindPod uh, network, where we have uh, where what I do here with Ramdas and Mind Rolling, Krishna Das and Jack Cornfield and Sharon Salzberg. It's our um, as as we have been told on the Mind Rolling podcast, our low hanging fruit group, which we love, and we're going to uh, invite some more of our uh, close friends and uh, expand that and and uh, but uh, we're seeing a lot of you come and support what we're doing over there alongside of what we're doing here with the uh, ramdas.org so can please continue we do need that support uh, uh in in all the realms that we are involved with to get this material and teachings and information out to everybody uh, that wants them and do what Ramdas. I always say this: do what Ramdas started to do when he first came back from India. Just share. So, see you next week. And now, here is Ramdas. Here and now. It's the Easter talks from 1976. And these gatherings are getting interesting for me because. I look around and there are just so many familiar beings. We've been gathering forever. And we've said it all. And there is nothing to say which makes it fun. Because if you and I both know that, then we can really play. There are strands of his story, his story, woven through this audience from every chapter of life. And every one of you has a mellow drama. <laughs> and you can appreciate the beauty of seeing all the strands woven together at a moment like this. You can imagine what it would be like in your life. For there are people here from my childhood, people here from graduate school, people here from Harvard, people here from Millbrook, and the drug days, people here from Maharaji's temple, people here from Bodh Gaya and the Vipassana meditation, people here from Muktananda's ashram, people here from Karmu, people here from Joya, people here from Haridas, People I met through Shlomo Kalbach. And 
on and on it goes. It's hard to imagine any one thing you could say that would be appropriate for that mixed a bag. Except I love you. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> bother to introduce all of you to each other. <laughs> I, I will pick out one person, however, I can't resist. Because it is because of his thought form at some level that we are here tonight. <laughs> Some of you saw a sun seed. Do you see sun seed? And uh, one of the people that stole the show, along with um, Sufi Sam and Maharaji, who only appeared for five seconds, uh, was uh, this man I'm going to introduce you to. To relieve the suffering of other human beings. And that pull exists in us, and that's what brings us partially together. And that is where I feel that he has transmitted to me something very pure and very beautiful. In the early years, we were too busy with our worlds to really have fun together as we've had in the past few years. And I think part of my story with my father has been of value to many of you in terms of the working through your relations with your parents. For many of you have read about Dad and I making raspberry jam together. For we meet now not so much as father and son, though I honor him as my father, but we meet as being to being. We are so close, I will tell you, that some years after my mother died, my father married again, an incredibly beautiful woman, my stepmother. And we are so close that I gave the bride away and I helped carry her across the threshold, which is a, that's as far as I would go, I want you to know, I, being Brahmachari and all that. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta watch these kids. <laughs> well enough, let me just invite you to share a welcome to my father who is sitting back there. Would you stand, Dad, and just say hello? That's fun. He just comes to see what this Meshuggah business is all about. You understand that? <laughs> no, he's a good sport, and we talk a lot about meditation and things like that. Yeah. This is an interesting space, Saturday night between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. This is the lowest time in the Christian scene, undoubtedly. For the form is gone, and the transformation and the rising has not yet occurred. That the story should run that way. It was Christ who said, Had ye but faith, you could move mountains. And you and I now are sophisticated enough about what are called siddhis or powers to know 
that the whole game was in Christ's hands. We've I mean, heard enough miracle stories now. People like Shirdi Sai Baba, who used to go to the river to wash themselves and pull his intestines out and scrub them and then swallow them back down. And even Christ brought Lazarus back from the dead. And a yogi is not his body. He knows that. You recall Ramana Maharshi's words when he was dying? I've said them often enough. When his devotee said, heal yourself, Bhagwan, and he said, no, I finished with this body. This body's done. And they started to cry and they said, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he said, don't be silly, where could I go? <laughs> now in that context, in which for a yogi of the faith of someone who is merged with the Father, of a yogi who had the faith to move mountains. Strange that he should have left the whole scene hanging for three days. Why didn't he just stick his tongue out on the cross? Saying, yeah, yeah, you can't get me. Yeah. Because all he was doing was nailing up his body. I mean, the Tibetan yogis used to fly around over cornfields and their cousins would wave at them. He could have taken a subtle body, gone out in the crowd and applauded, or could have done any number of up level type things. Let's assume that he just wasn't kind of a sloppy yogi, and that he really had total control of the scene, and he was really designing the game as a very powerful transmission. He was offering his life as a perfect statement. Not only his life, but his death and his rebirth. What then is this period? What is this dark night of the soul? Could it be that he intentionally let everybody suffer? Could it be that he let the disciples disperse and he let his mother be agonized? If he did this intentionally, is it because he's wanting in compassion Christ, who we know to be a statement of such pure love? Is it possible that this time period, which since Christ was perfect consciousness, he didn't go anywhere, so he was aware of what was happening to everybody else, and he loved all these people, as is evidenced by his life, so it must have been hard on him, that he did this out of caring? that in some way this was a grace period? The reason it seems relevant to preoccupy us with these couple of days, since it is our fortune to be meeting on this night, is because the one difficulty most of us have is it interpreting our suffering and our doubt and our confusion and our loss of faith
as part of the process of awakening. We keep feeling we fell out of grace. We blew it. Why aren't I high? What happened? Life stinks. Before it used to be all sweetness and light, and now somehow it's heavy for me. Not for all of you at all moments, but every one of you has those moments. I sure do. Christ comes forth, he performs miracles, he says, look, it isn't the way you think it is at all. You aren't who you think you are, I'm not who you think I am. We are all in the Father, come on, wake up. Let go of all your worldly nonsense, let's get on with it. And everybody around him gets hooked on him because he's got all his power. And he splits. And everybody gets depressed. They got hooked on their method. Their method of getting high. And the method split. If you're an acid head, you ran out of acid. Or like some of us, our guru left his body. Or a method that's been getting you high for years, singing to Krishna, or following your breath, suddenly turns into a straw in your mouth. It's yuck. It doesn't work anymore. What about all those lows? When you're angry, when you're getting fired, when you've run out of welfare, when your car breaks down, when there's an unexpected pregnancy, when there is a fight, when there is violence in the neighborhood, when there is racial tension in the community, when there is ecological disaster imminent at every turn. All of this does an interesting thing. It throws us back in upon ourselves for us to see where we're at. When all the pins get pulled away from you, then you have a chance for a moment to see what resources you have. We come together representative of many, many methods. All the way from Krishnamurti who says there is no method. Krishna consciousness or fundamental Christianity which says our way is the only way and it has much form. And where we meet is in what is common to all of our forms. And what is common to all of our forms is not another form. What is common to all of our forms is choiceless awareness. is pure love, is flow and harmony in the universe, is the absence of clinging, is 
is spaciousness. You can call this Buddha mind. You can call it the heart of Allah. You could call it Christ consciousness. You could call it Yahweh or G-D. I have involved myself with many forms, methods of Vipassana meditation to make me more mindful, to quiet my mind and to bring it to one-pointedness. Devotional practices of worshiping the feet of my guru and singing Hare Krishna and Sri Ram Jai Ram of Zen meditation, of confronting a koan, or just sitting, of study, of the Bhagavad Gita, of the Tibetan Book of the Great Liberation, of Chang Tzu and Lao Tzu, of the I Ching and the Tao Te Ching, and on and on and on of the New Testament and the Old Testament. How does it all come together? There is no form that represents the amalgam of all those things. If you follow all of them to the apex, you are pushed beyond form. You are pushed into the moment. The merging with God is right here. Feel your heart. Is it flowing? Breathe in and out of your heart, middle of your chest, as if there were a flow flowing in and out with every breath. Flowing, present, quiet, here. More here. More. Let go of your expectations a little more. of your definitions of who you are, of what God is, of where you're going, of where you've come from. Of your emotions, sadness, happiness, don't push them away, notice them, acknowledge them, give them space. They are all part of the flow. Your senses, your memories, your plans, your models, all of it. Passing show. Forms being created, existing, and disappearing back into formlessness. Here in the moment. Right here. For the end result of everything that you and I have been sharing for years and years is not there or then, or maybe, or perhaps, or if only, or as soon as I, this is it.
look at the stuff in you that is keeping you from being here at this moment. Judging, waiting, trying to experience. I can't get it. I still feel separate. That thought is the problem right there. Let it go. The quiet mind, choiceless awareness, perfect flow and harmony. No you, no self-consciousness, not I am trying to become enlightened. For example, in meditation, there is no meditator in meditation. Meditation is. If you still have a meditator, you aren't medita in meditation. Meditation is the act of openness, of spaciousness, of presence, of isness. Why are we joining all these clubs? Why are we paying these heavy dues? What is that all about? Are all methods to be avoided? It doesn't seem so. But it does seem useful to see them in perspective. Methods are the ship crossing the ocean of existence. If you're halfway across the ocean, it's a little silly to decide methods are a bummer if you don't know how to swim. But once you get to the far shore, it would be silly to keep carrying your boat portage, for there is no more water. The game seems very simple. There are methods. Methods are not the thing itself. Methods are traps. You use methods, you entrap yourself in order to burn out things in you which keep you from being free. And ultimately the methods spew you out at the other end and the method disintegrates into nothingness. Every method. The guru, chanting, study, meditation, practices, all of it. For the end result is nothing special. reason we clean away stuff and don't just get high and why we get very interested in what goes on between Good Friday and Easter Sunday in ourselves and why we start to focus on our depressions and our negativity and all of our heavy is because we're getting hip to the fact that if we push stuff under the rug, sooner or later there is karmuppance. <laughs> I'll tell you how far out it is. I was reflecting on it recently. A few weeks ago, we have a uh, prison ashram project. And one of the parts of the project in California is that we help subsidize some yoga programs in prisons. We don't do much of that. Mainly we put out a magazine called Inside Out, which as you know is designed to convert prisons into ashrams. Well, 
recently in the, I was in California, and I was invited to visit Death Row at San Quentin. And I spent four hours on Death Row. Whatever is left of my mind to be blown was blown by that experience. To be as honest as I try always to be with you and with me, I sat outside the prison before I went in in my car, my rented car, looking at San Quentin. And I visit a lot of prisons, and I always have that feeling when I'm going into a prison because of perhaps my old days and the karma accrued from previous incarnations of I'll be happy to go in, but I'll be happy to come out. Because there is a certain kind of paranoia in the searching procedures and in the authority structure and all that I have to work hard to keep consuming. Perhaps I think they will still find out that I smuggled. Tootsie Rolls or whatever. <laughs> so I sat outside the prison, if you pardon the pun, stealing myself to enter the walls. And I went in and I was met by all the yogis who teach there and the warden who was a very nice guy. And we were immediately whisked up to death row. I came on the row. The row is, there are two rows actually, because there are so many of these guys. And they are in separate cells, segregated of course, in a long, two long rows separated by a wall. And the, wall, the rows are long enough so that since they can't come out of their cells, we had mirrors set up in front of each cell so I could sit in the center of, say, 10 or 15 of them, 10 of them maybe, and they could all see me from where they were sitting in their cells and we could work together. But before that, I went up to each cell, looked in the cell, shook hands through the little food place. Six by nine cell, right? These men are in a peculiar predicament. The death penalty is being reconsidered by the Supreme Court. As you know from the recent decision regarding homosexuality and others, the court is very conservative these days, you might say reactionary. And there is a good likelihood from the way in which they heard evidence that the death penalty will be reinstituted. California has already voted to reinstitute the death penalty if the Supreme Court concurs. So when the Supreme Court decision comes down, most of these men will die within 60 to 90 days. Out of, I think, the 34, I don't remember the exact number, the 34 men, there were not more than five who did not receive me openly, clearly, quietly, consciously. The feeling I had was that I was visiting a monastery and that these were monks in their cells. For these men who are facing death have been pushed into a situation that has cut through their melodrama and they are right here. We had a meditation in which as part of the meditation we were sending out thought forms of love and peace to all the beings in the universe, direct from death row. I became so affected by the vibration of the space that it was very hard for me to keep coming down enough to get up and move to the next group. There was 
light pouring out of these beings' eyes. Now, by the way, their cells are interesting. For only about a third of the cells have pictures of Playboy girls. The rest of them have pictures of um, Christ, Mary. One has Hieronymus Bosch painting. They have mandalas. Their books include Alan Watts, the Bible, uh, the impersonal life, uh, I Ching, the East West Journal and the New Age Journal and Spiritual Community Guide give away all of their extra issues and so their cells have all of those in them. I assume 29 of those 34 people could be sitting in this room tonight and sharing this moment with us. And we got so open that I was able to say without them freaking, I can't tell whether what's happened to you is a blessing or a curse. For there isn't a chance of a snowball in hell that any of us would have met were you not in this situation. To prove my point, I'll tell you that I spent a half an hour on one of the other segregated cell blocks of people that are serving life sentences. Out of them, the percentages are just what you'd expect in a society. Maybe one out of a hundred was open. The rest you could feel, the cynicism, the doubt, the put down, the sarcasm. Now, do you want to see the bizarre humor of this, the black humor? If the Supreme Court stops the death penalty, these men will all become lifers and almost all of them will lose this consciousness. And if they die, they will have this consciousness right up to the moment they enter the gas chamber. Does that mean they're home free? Does that mean all the karma that has accrued to them because for the most case, they have been involved in killing another human being. Is it over? No. For if you see what happens at the moment of death, and I'll tell you about seeing that in a second, you can go into death with Ram on your lips, with Christ in your heart, high, clear, and in samadhi. But whatever stuff is left, whatever stuff was covered over by your situational high occurring at the time of dying, as your ego structure starts to lose its control, that stuff will bubble up again. and you will once again renew your karmic run-through. You know the old Zen monk who was dying, who had finished everything. He was to be free, he was to get off the wheel, and he's just floating away, free in his pure Buddha mind. And a thought passes by of a beautiful deer he once saw in a field. And he just holds on to that thought for a second because of its beauty. And he takes birth again as a deer. It's as subtle as that. You can't cheat the game by getting high is what I'm pointing out.
the situation these guys are in is forcing their high, their consciousness, their awareness, their openness. But it's not burning out their karma totally. It will help. One moment in which they feel compassion for the person that they may have murdered. will do much for their karma. But not all of it. Last week I was in Chicago and I spent an evening with a woman named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. Many of you I'm sure have heard of her. She has written a number of books about dying. She's a doctor and she works with people that die. She's just written a, written a foreword for a book that has just come out. It's called Life After Life. It's a book describing the experience of people who died, who were called clinically dead, and then came back to life, and describe what happened to them after they died. You've got to appreciate the beauty of that book. Here she is a noted Swiss physician, psychiatrist, therapist, medical doctor, who is invited to speak before a thousand neurosurgeons about dying. She has described exquisitely the stages people go through as they approach death. The resistance, the denial, the bargaining, the anger, the despair, and then the opening space. That opening space, which is what's on San Quentin death row. But what does she and I talk about? What happens after death? And the beauty of that book is that it's what's called hard data. It's data designed to convince the scientific community. I said to her, you have a hard row to hoe to convince the scientific community. I decided a long time ago to just become it. Don't prove anything to anybody. And she said, well, you and I have different dharma. She does it with no attachment, no clinging, very light, very dancing. And when I said to her, isn't it remarkable how many thousands of beings I've met this year, I have lectured to 70,000 people in this United States. How many beings are sitting here with us, Elizabeth, sharing this kind of consciousness? She said, well, don't you understand we're all on death row? You see the horrible beauty of that image? Do you see the way in which technology, the human intellect, has forced us to the cusp, which has confronted us with our own limitations and forced the awakening? And here we are on death row. And so in this lifetime, on this earth, we're situationally high, you and I. But don't kid yourself. You're not done with your karma. Don't figure you can ride out on a wave of, of the end of the earth. The, that Armageddon can get you so high, 
you can flow through and at the moment of death go out shouting Ram and you made it. Just a cheap high. That's why you need the Saturdays between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. You need to keep remembering who you're not. You need to keep cleaning up. Doing the practices and sweeping the temple. That's all there is to it. You do the practices and you sweep the temple. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at Ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you. Thank you.